Hello everybody and welcome back to Guided Hacking. Today we're going to be taking a look at Crash Tech Loader and how we can go from an initial sample all the way to a final payload. Let's begin. We begin our analysis with this binary here. Let's first check it out in Detector Easy to see what it might be. Looking at Detector Easy, we see a few different outputs. First being the compiler being C or C++. And then also it also says that there's an overlay of a zip archive and it's detected it as an archive with six files within it. So if this is a zip archive, why don't we first try and unarchive it? Now that I've unarchived the binary, we find out that it was actually a zip file that contained six different PEs. These six PEs are all different kinds of binaries and some of them are legit but one of them is not like the others. To find out which one is the binary that we're looking for, we could go through and execute each one in a sandbox and see how they act within the sandbox. That way we can find malicious actions carried out by the binary, but I'll save us the time of looking through those and go straight to the one that I know is malicious, being this kifapp2.exe. The actor will pack all of these different binaries together, some being legit and some being malicious, to try and throw off researchers and also antivirus. So let's take a look at what the KIF app might be written in so that we can determine what program to be opening it with. Again, we make use of Detector Easy and we can see within Detector Easy that it's written in .NET version four. So we'll go to our standard tool for .NET reversing, which is dnspy. Now that we've opened the binary within Detector Easy, we can see a description that's within the assembly. We can see that the binary is marked with a description of being a app for physical training, nutrition, and diet, and other fitness topics. This isn't true, as we'll find out later, but this is also a technique that the actor is using to throw off any researchers or anybody who has mistakenly downloaded this app under a false pretense. Looking through the binary, we can see what looks like a form that is run on main. So whenever this binary is run, a GUI will be displayed. Within the GUI, there's a few buttons that'll open different URLs. Let's visit this URL and see what it may end up being. Of course, when you're going to open URL from malware, you should always be using a VPN. The domain doesn't resolve, so let's continue our analysis. So we can see within the initialized component of this form that it's creating a GUI with a bunch of different components, such as picture boxes and buttons. If I look within the resources of the binary, I can see some of the pictures that are being used. These pictures look like they are related to fitness, as we saw in the description, but we can also see on the final picture that there's an advert for a cryptocurrency exchange site. This is our first indication that this binary may be malicious. Looking through the binary, in dnspy i've opened some of the different classes and we see some interesting name schemes here within the kif september core we see names such as get ip loader network interface path and regedic these all sound as if they are functions that would be used by malware especially the loader and get ip let's take a closer look looking at the get ip function we can see that it's requesting the, the api of ip pfi to get the public ip of an infection let's see where this function is called from we'll right click on it go on analyze and then go use by and to find where it's been called from. Double clicking on this, we can see the HTTP connection being called and we can see some more functions that are being called to put together information about the victim. We begin by initializing a web client, then defining a security protocol. This is probably for HTTPS communications later on. Then the malware will get a username from the path variable and the system version from the path variable. These are built into .NET, so it's very easy to get information about a infected system. Then the malware will get a client from resources.c. If we follow this, this is a string, and it'll be getting it from the resource manager. I'm not sure exactly what this does, so let's go and do a quick Google to find out more. Looking on the MSDN documentation site, we can see the resource manager.getString method. And we can see that it's used to return a specified string resource for the specified culture or current UI culture. I still don't completely understand what this is doing. So I'm just going to run it in the debugger and then break on this call to see what it may be finding. So I'm just going to right click on the line and click breakpoint and then run the malware. So I run the malware and we can see that the malware has braked on where we set a breakpoint here. But the NSPI can't get the variables because they're generated by the decompiler. So we're going to have to step through until it's used. I'll add another breakpoint on the call and we can rerun the malware to get to where we want to be. So now that we've broken on the appropriate part of the malware, we can see within our local variables that the key client has a value of client two, which is probably a 
name for this program that's being defined by the previously mentioned function. So this is used by the malware operator to track which one of their binaries is being used and this data will be sent to a panel so that they can track their infection. So once all of the information about the victim is collected, we can see that those values are uploaded to what seems like a panel. Let's see what the string is for the panel. And we could see that the panel link is a base64 string. So if I bring this into Cyberchef, we'll be able to see what the actual panel is. And within Cyberchef, we can see the panel URL here. Now let's see what happens if I browse to this URL. If I browse to the URL, we can see the login page for the panel. So we know it's alive. This will be useful for when we try to get the final payload later on. So analyzing, we can see that the infection information is sent to the panel and then the response of the panel is put into this byte array. Then this byte array here is turned into a string and for each item in a regex, it will then be called by a function called loaders. So it is likely that this will be loading whatever is returned by the panel. To see what the panel is returning, I'm just going to set a breakpoint on this loop here and we can see what the response is from the panel and what the malware is getting back from the panel. So running the malware with the breakpoint, let's see what we get. We break on the breakpoint and we can see that we get a response of setup2.exe here and it's from a URL on on the C2. So we can go ahead and check out the loader function and then download this executable from the C2 to see what it's trying to load. Within the loader function, we can see that it's simply just getting a folder path, downloading the file, and then it's just starting the process. So there isn't any kind of decryption or unpacking process of the second stage binary, meaning that we can just download it and analyze it to see what this loader is loading. Before I get onto the final payload, I would just like to look at some of the other functions, mainly the path and regedit function. The path function seems to be just defining some strings and we can see some registry strings here. Also some information that is used when victim information is sent to the panel. Checking regedit, we can see that the malware is checking the registry for the previously seen path. And then it's also adding itself to the registry. This will be used in an attempt to stop itself from being run twice. So it'll add itself to the registry. And then on a second attempt, it'll check the registry so that if a registry key exists, it won't run. We can confirm this by looking at the function that calls the these functions. Here we can see the main of the malware. So we can see that if the registry key exists, the environment will exit. If the, registry, if the registry key does not exist, then the loading function will be executed. It'll also run the form that I mentioned earlier if the loading is successful. So let's go ahead and check the final payload. Instead of manually analyzing the malware, if we just want to find out what the malware family is and what it is, it would be easier to use an online sandbox. So I'm just going to use triage here that I mentioned in an earlier video, and I'm going to fetch it with this function here. And then I'm just going to set up a quick analysis task for that binary. While this sandbox run runs, why don't we just check out what the GUI looks like? So I'm just going to execute the malware and we'll see what it looks like. Running the malware, we can see that the GUI looks like so. It certainly looks like a very basic interface. None of these buttons really function and they bring us to the dead site I mentioned at the start of this video. And now that the execution of our second stage payload is finished, we can see that it is redlined. So I hope this was a good overview of how I go from start to finish with looking at malware like this. I know it was pretty simple, but it's good to always have these easy techniques in the back of your pocket for when you need them. This malware is quite prominent and you shouldn't underestimate simple code because sometimes simple is better. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.